Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We started talking about al zihar and we mentioned a few introductory words and issues pertaining to this topic. So let's take these a hadith coming up in this chapter, hadith 948. فأتى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إني وقعت عليها قبل أن أكفر قال فلا تقربها حتى تفعل ما أمرك الله تعالى به رواه الأربعة وصححه الترمذي ورجح النسائي إرساله ورواه البزار من وجه آخر عن ابن عباس وزاد في كفر ولا تعد from Ibn Abbas, he says that a man made dhihar on his wife, but then after that, he had intercourse with her. And so he came to the Prophet, والسلام, telling him about what had happened, and he told him that I had intercourse with my wife before making the kafara for the dhihar. And the Prophet replied by saying, do not go near her until you do what Allah Ta'ala has ordered you to do. The hadith is sahih, and in a wording of Al-Bazzar, the Prophet said, expiate the vihar and do not repeat such an action. When a person makes a vihar on his wife, then he's not allowed to have intercourse with her until he expiates for this vihar. And we mentioned this idea of when to perform the expiation. Does it have to be before the intercourse or is it allowed to be after the intercourse? We'll move on to talking about the expiation in a bit more detail later on, inshallah. But right now, we need to know that when a dhihar is made, then a man is not allowed to have intercourse with the wife. However, he is allowed to do other things like touch her and fondle her and kiss with her and eat with her and generally have a relationship of this type. It's just the intercourse which is haram. We take from this narration that the Sahaba were eager to seek knowledge. Even though this narration is talking about a particular Sahabi, but they were all the same in terms of their eagerness in seeking knowledge. We have many narrations in which the Sahaba come to the Prophet asking him questions. And then we have other general evidences where the Sahaba would be sitting with the Prophet in circles of knowledge. The point is there is no doubt that the Sahaba were eager to learn. And this is in stark contrast to the Muslims of nowadays. They simply don't care. All they care about is making their money, feeding themselves and their families. Their life is not too dissimilar to that of a kafir. But when you're involved with seeking knowledge and learning, this really does separate you from that of a kafir. Otherwise, the minimum you need to do to separate yourself from a kafir is the five times salah. This is the bare minimum. However, a Muslim who is intelligent knows that he does not want to restrict himself to the bare minimum. Rather, he wants to raise his standards and be the best he can possibly be. And the way to do that, or at least one of the most effective ways, is to seek knowledge and be regular in seeking knowledge. And to be as enthusiastic about seeking knowledge as you are about making money. Or really, even more so. Because with money, you have to protect it, and it gives you a headache and worry about protecting it. Whereas knowledge protects you. And we find in the other narration, the Prophet told him to expiate for this dhihar and do not do it again. Meaning, do not ever have intercourse with your wife again before expiating for the dhihar if you make dhihar on your wife. And so this is an evidence for those people who say that you are not allowed to have intercourse with the wife until you expiate. Remember, the other opinion was that it doesn't make a difference whether you do it before or after the intercourse. And when Allah Jalla wa ala says, Min qabli an yatamassa, before they touch each other, then they say, in accordance with their opinion, that this is not actually intended. Meaning to say, before they touch each other, this stipulation is not intended. And the reason is because he does not mention this for the third option, which is feeding the 60 poor people. And then we can have the other opinion, the third one, which says that if you're going to free a servant or fast the 60 consecutive days then it must be before because Allah Jalla wa ala specifically mentions before but if you're going to feed the 60 poor people then it could be done even after having the intercourse but we say the safest opinion is as this hadith tells us 
whichever one you're going to do, it needs to be done before. Of course, when it comes to the expiation, it needs to be done in order. So the priority is that you have to free a servant. If you cannot find a servant, then you would have to fast the 60 days. If you are unable to do that, then you would have to feed the 60 poor people. And these are 60 different poor people, not just one poor person. You feed him 60 times. No, that's not good enough. It needs to be 60 poor people, meaning 60 different poor people. So you feed 60 poor people, you do not feed 60 times. So notice the difference. Hadith number 949 وعن سلمة بن صخر رضي الله عنه قال دخل رمضان فخفت أن أصيب امرأتي فظاهرت منها فانكشف لي شيء منها ليلة فوقعت عليها فقال لي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حرر رقبة فقلت ما أملك إلا رقبتي قال فصم شهرين متتابعين قلت وهل أصبت الذي أصبت إلا من الصيام قال أطعم فرقا من تمر ستين مسكينة أخرجه أحمد والأربعة إلا النسائية وصححه ابن خزيمة وابن الجارود From Salama ibn Sakhar he says that the month of Ramadan entered and I feared that I might, by mistake, have intercourse with my wife. So he was fearing that his desires would overcome him. And during the daytime of Ramadan, he has intercourse with his wife. So what he did, he says, that I made a dhihar on her. This is to prevent himself from having intercourse with the wife. And he says that one night, some part of the body was uncovered. And that tempted him to have intercourse with her. And so he informed the Prophet about this. And the Prophet said to me, he says, free a neck meaning to say free a servant and i replied i don't own any neck except my own and so the prophet then said fast two consecutive months and i said am i in this situation except because of the fasting meaning to say it was fasting which actually put me into this dilemma so how can i solve this dilemma by fasting so then the prophet told him feed 60 poor people a faraq of dates and a faraq is equivalent to about three sa' of the Prophet's sa'. The narration is Hassan. So we find in this narration a man called Salama ibn Sakhar, one of the Sahabi, made dhihar on his wife during the month of Ramadan. This was in order to prevent himself from having intercourse with the wife. Of course, a dhihar is haram, whether it is done in Ramadan or outside, but in any case, this is what he did. And in the beginning, when Ramadan was first made wajib to fast therein, the rule was this. After Salat al usha the man was not allowed to have intercourse with the wife. So even during the night time of Ramadan, after usha he was not allowed to have intercourse. And the second scenario where he's not allowed to have intercourse is if he goes to sleep, even if it is before usha So let's say before usha he goes to sleep. Then if he wakes up after that, then he's not allowed to have intercourse with the wife. So these are two occasions where he's not allowed to have intercourse with the wife in Ramadan. Of course, the daytime of Ramadan, it has always been the case. You're not allowed to have intercourse with the wife. And so this ruling with these two scenarios, which we have just mentioned, was difficult for the Muslims to take. And so Allah Jalla wa ala abrogated this ruling in order to make life easier for the Muslims. And we could find this happening. A strict ruling is given and then it is made easier meaning to say it is abrogated. Why is this the case? We can say that the reason or the wisdom behind this is so that the Muslims can appreciate the mercy of Allah Jalla wa ala, that he wants to make life easy for you. If we go the other way around, an easy ruling abrogated for a more difficult ruling, then this is understandable as well because Allah Jalla wa ala wants to prepare the Muslims by giving them something easy first and then building them up to that which is harder to take. Because then, at least they're prepared to accept the harder ruling. So we find that both types of abrogations going either way, they do have wisdom behind them. So the point is, afterwards, this was abrogated and the man is allowed to have intercourse with his wife after the Maghrib time. Because that is the time you're not fasting. And it makes no difference whether it is before or after Isha or before or after you go to sleep. It's just that you're not allowed to have intercourse with the wife when you are fasting in Ramadan between Fajr and Maghrib. 
So we find in this narration that this man made two mistakes. Firstly, he performed the dhihar, which must never be performed in all cases. And secondly, he violated the sanctity of Ramadan. But he came to the Prophet in a penitent state. And this is what Allah Jalla wa'ala loves. No matter how big a sin you commit, as long as you are penitent, then Allah Jalla wa'ala is always ready to accept you back. We learn from this narration that the kafara of the dhihar is done in order. If you cannot do one, then you move on to the next. If you cannot do the next, then you move on to the third option. Even if you cannot perform the third option, it does not mean that the obligation is waived from you. Rather, it remains in your responsibility. So the moment you are able to feed 60 poor people, you're going to have to do that. So it remains a debt upon you, just as if you owed somebody a hundred pounds and you're not able to pay back. The debt is not forgiven. It still remains on you. It's just that when you have the money, you would have to pay back. And so this kafara is also a debt. So when a person dies, we often talk about the debt which he owes to other people, but we may not talk about the debt which he owes to Allah Jalla wa'ala. And so the kafara, the zakah, these are all debts which you owe to Allah and they must be given. Notice that the kafara for the vihar is exactly the same as the kafara for having intercourse with your wife when you're fasting in the daytime of Ramadan. You'll remember in the Kitab al-Siyam, we took the hadith where the man had intercourse with his wife in the daytime of Ramadan when he was fasting and the Prophet mentioned the exact same kafara. We also take from this hadith that making ishtihad when you don't have knowledge is dangerous because here is this man, Salma ibn Sakhar, he made this ishtihad. He made dhihar during Ramadan. And of course this is out of his own ishtihad. He possibly thought that Having intercourse with the wife is much more serious than making vihar. So therefore, you're allowed to make vihar for the case of Ramadan. And so we can see it landed him into trouble. So when it comes to normal Muslims or even students of knowledge, they must not make ishtihad until they are well versed in knowledge. And always the safest option is to turn to a trustworthy scholar. We also take an important lesson here. Why did this man have intercourse with the wife? It is because, as he says himself, some part of her was uncovered. So we can easily take then that if some part of the woman is uncovered, it can excite the natural sexual urges of the man. We're not talking about the whole body, just even a part of it can do the job. So it is upon the Muslim who has taqwa of Allah Jalla wa'ala not to be looking at these immoral and improperly dressed licentious women that you would find in the West because these women expose just a bit more than a little part of the body. They expose much of the body and this will lead to the inevitable result in exciting the sexual urges of the male which is ultimately calling you to perform zina or at least to encourage you to look more at these women and hence perform zina of the eyes. So we find then that all wisdom lies in this sharia in ordering the men to lower their gaze and ordering the women to dress properly and take some responsibility in dressing. And no attention needs to be paid to these kuffar women who say that we will dress however we want to and it is the men's responsibility not to look. We say sure it is the men's responsibility not to look. In fact Allah Jalla wa orders the men first to lower their gazes. Only then does he turn the attention to women. But this does not mean to say that women are not obliged to take responsibility. Absolutely they're obliged to take responsibility. And so they have to play their role and the men have to play their role. So no attention needs to be paid to the kuffar women who say we will dress however we want to. What they're doing in actual fact is that they're taking their desires as their God. So they want to follow their lusts and their desires without any responsibility. And so the Muslim woman who has fear of Allah Jalla wa'ala is nothing like women of this type. And the message which every Prophet has brought as explained to us by the Prophet ﷺ from that which the people have understood from the very first prophetic teaching is that he explains إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ if you do not feel shy, then do as you wish. So modesty, shyness and bashfulness are good 
proper moral qualities, which every human being has been born with. But it's just the problem that the love of this world and desires and being a slave to shaitan overcomes this good quality of modesty. So the point is that these kuffar women do not feel any shame and they don't have any concept of the fear of Allah or being taken to account in the hereafter. And so when all of these ingredients are mixed, then you simply get these women dressing the way they do. They call it freedom, but we have already said that true freedom is freedom from Jahannam. And also from this narration we can take the Rahmah of Allah Jalla wa'ala in that he institutionalizes these kafarat. And this is because he's saving you from the punishment in the hereafter. So he's actually doing you a favor. You'd rather pay for your sin in this world than in the hereafter. And also from the hadith we can take that freeing a servant is from the kafara, and this shows us that freeing a servant is something that Allah Jalla wa'ala really is looking for us to do. So either you free a servant through a kafara, or you just simply free a servant just like that as an act of charity. It is extremely reward worthy. Okay, so let us now move on to talking about the kafara of the dhihar. The word kafara first of all comes from the root letters kafara, which means to cover something. And so a kafara means that which covers, because when you commit a sin and then you have to offer the kafara, then this kafara which you offer covers your sin so that it will not show up on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and you will not be taken into account for it because you have already paid for this sin. So this kafara therefore covers your sin. We have mentioned before what this kafara is. It is to Number one, free a believing servant. If you cannot do so, it would be to fast two consecutive months. And of course, with months, we mean lunar months. If you are unable to do that, it would be to feed 60 poor people. So when does the kafara become wajib? It becomes wajib when you have intercourse with the wife. It does not become wajib before that. So the kafara does not become wajib merely by you making the zihar on your wife. As for the individual three categories of the kafara, then they become wajib as soon as you are able to perform them. For example, as soon as you are able to purchase a servant, a believing servant that is, to free him, then this becomes obligatory upon you. If in the case you are unable to purchase a servant to free him, and then you move on to fasting the two consecutive months, because this is what you can do, then during the middle of these two months, you are able to purchase a servant to free him. What do we say in a case like this? Is it obligatory upon you to stop the fasting and resort to the option number one, which is to free a believing servant? The answer is no. You simply continue on the fasting because the freeing of a servant now is no longer obligatory upon you. It would only have been obligatory if you had the means to be able to free a believing servant. Or for example, let us suppose that he is also unable to fast two consecutive lunar months, so he resorts to feeding the 60 poor people. Now in the middle of doing so, he finds energy and strength to fast the two consecutive months. Should he resort to the fasting now? The answer is no, because the fasting of two consecutive months is no longer obligatory upon him. It would have only been obligatory upon him if he was able to fast the two months at that time. But because he wasn't, then it is no longer obligatory upon him and he does not need to resort to it afterwards. So let's talk about the first option which is to free a believing servant. How do we decide that you have enough money to free a believing servant? Well firstly if you own a believing servant then you free him. But perhaps a Muslim does not have a believing servant under his authority but he does have money. Well then he has to with this money purchase a believing servant in order to free him. But what about this money then? How much money should he have? Well, we say he needs to see how much he needs for his basic requirements for himself and his family. Then, after the basic requirements, if he has enough money to purchase a believing servant, then he must do so. If he does not have enough money to purchase a believing servant, then we simply tell him that the freeing of a believing servant is not obligatory upon you because you are from those people who do not find the means to purchase and free a believing servant. However, what about this scenario that you do have enough money after your basic needs 
to purchase the believing servant. However, this believing servant is being sold at a price far higher than normal. Some scholars say that even if you do have enough money to purchase this overpriced servant, you don't have to because he's being sold at far higher price than normal. And it could be that the seller of this servant knows that you have a kafara of the vihar to perform and so he wants to take advantage and so he charges you a higher price. So this type of trickery could be played. So some scholars have said that if the price is far higher than normal, then even if you do have enough money to pay for the higher price which is being charged, you still don't have to purchase this servant. But if we take a look at the ayah, it says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ So whoever does not find the servant, then he has to fast the two consecutive months. So what we can reasonably extract from this is that if you are able to purchase this servant, even if it is at a higher price than normal, but as long as it will not harm you, then you have to purchase this believing servant, even if he is being sold for a price higher than normal. But as long as it will not harm you, then you must resort to this option. If a person has a servant whom he really needs for his everyday life, do we tell him that for your zihar you must free this servant? Well, the answer is that if he has a desperate need for this servant, then this man's need takes precedence over the kafara. So we would not obligate him to free the servant if his everyday needs are pertaining to this servant and dependent on this servant. But if it be the case that he can do without the servant, then he is obligated to free this servant if he is a believer. So what about this example then? A man has, let's say, £100,000, but he trades with this 100,000 and he lives off the profit which he makes. And if he was to purchase a servant with this money, then his profit would decrease and that would adversely affect his daily living. We say to him in a situation like this, because it would adversely affect your basic needs, then you do not have to purchase a servant with this money of yours, even though the amount of money is quite a lot. Or for example, he may have a lot of money, but he also has other debts to pay off. So those debts would take priority. So we tell him that you don't need to purchase a servant with this money of yours because you have a debt pertaining to this money of yours. Notice in the ayah it says that you have to free a neck. It does not actually mention that it has to be a believing neck, meaning a believing servant. But we say it has to be a believing servant. Because in the kafara for the accidental murder, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنًا And whoever kills a believer out of a mistake, then he has to free a believing servant. So in the case of vihar, you also have to free a servant, but it is mutlaq, unrestricted, just any servant. But in the ayah of the accidental murder, it is muqayyad or restricted. So it's restricted to being a believing servant. So because the ruling is one and the same, which is to free a servant, we restrict the mutlaq with the muqayyad and we say that also in the freeing of a servant when it comes to vihar, it also needs to be a believing servant and not a disbelieving one. Meaning to say it is not allowed to be a kafir servant. Other kafarat in which you have to free a servant are breaking an oath and also having intercourse with your wife during the daytime of Ramadan. And in only one of them is a believing servant mentioned. The other evidences do not mention a believing servant, rather they just mention a servant. So because the ruling is one and the same, which is freeing a servant because of this kafara, then we carry the mutlaq on the muqayyad. And we say that in all cases it has to be a believing servant. And what supports this ruling of ours is firstly, in addition to the rules of usul al-fiqh which we have just used, in which we carry the mutlaq and the muqayyad, we also have the evidence in Sahih Muslim in which a man hit his servant girl and he regretted it and wanted to free her and so the Prophet called her, where is this servant girl, bring her to me and he asked the servant girl this question, where is Allah and she says, Fis sama in the highness and then he asked her, who am I and she said, Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah and so the Prophet then told this man Free her because she is a believer. 
which basically means that if she was not a believer then you don't need to free her and also we can just argue with pure reason we can say that if he's a kafir and you free him then the likelihood is that he's going to join his fellow kuffar and harm the muslims do not forget where he came from he came as war booty which basically means it is likely that he was fighting the Muslims and so he was taken as a prisoner of war and made into a servant of the Muslim. So if you free him again, there is every chance that he will regroup with the Kuffar and harm the Muslims. So it is better to keep him as a servant. So this is a condition with the servant that he has to be a believer. Also another condition is that the servant needs to be free of any defects which would hinder him doing the job of a servant. So this servant needs to be in pretty good shape and health. For example, if he is blind, then this is a defect which will certainly hinder him from performing a good job as a servant. Therefore, this servant is not allowed to be freed. But if he just has a minor defect, which would not hinder him from doing a good job as a servant, then this type of defect does not harm and he can be freed. And the Zahiriya say, no, this is not a condition because Allah Jalla wa Ala does not make mention of this as a condition. Rather, the only condition that Allah puts is that he must be a believer. But most of the scholars say, as we have said with the first opinion, that he has to be free of any defects which would hinder him performing a good job as a servant. For example, if he has a paralyzed hand, this is a clear hindrance. Or if he has some fingers missing, this is also a clear hindrance. Or for example, if he is so ill and you have lost hope that he will recover, then this is not good enough to be freed. What about a mudabbar servant? A mudabbar is a servant where his master says to him that after I die, you will be free. So a person who has a kafara to pay for the zihar, can he free a mudabbar servant? The answer is yes, he can. So a person can purchase a mudabbar servant and free him and there's no problem with that and it would serve as the kafara for the dhihar. What about if a servant is given as a rahan or a pledge? You'll remember in the Kitab al bayr we spoke about the rahan. Well the point about the servant being a rahan is that you're not allowed to free him because the right of somebody else is pertaining to the servant. So a person wants to buy something and he doesn't have the full price so he gives his servant to the seller. And this is as a rahan, so that if he cannot pay the full price, the seller can sell the servant and redeem the money. So now the rights of the seller are pertaining to the servant, and so the owner of the servant is not allowed to free this particular servant. So if somebody was to free this servant as a kafara for the zuhar, then this would not suffice. And similarly, what about a servant who has murdered somebody else? Is he allowed to be freed? The answer is no, because at this point now, somebody else's rights are pertaining to the servant because the relatives of the killed may want to retaliate against the servant and have him killed. So the point is, this servant is now at risk of justifiably losing his life. And so this type of servant, if you were to free him and then he was to die, this would be no use. The idea is to free a servant who will live on. If we have a servant girl who is pregnant, are we allowed to free her as an expiation for the dhihar? The answer is yes. It is possible to free her and to make the child as an exception so that the child will not be freed. Is it permissible for somebody to sell a servant girl who is pregnant but make an exception with the child? So he says, I'll sell you the servant girl, but the child which is in the belly or the womb would remain with me as a servant. The answer here is yes, it is permissible because here you're not selling something which is unknown. You are keeping it back. What is haram is to sell something which is unknown. So if you were to sell the unborn child of this servant girl independently, then this would be haram because you are selling something which is unknown. So those were a few issues pertaining to the freeing of a servant. Let's move to the second option, which is to fast two consecutive months. And you resort to this option if you are unable to free a servant, as we said before. Because Allah says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ And whoever does not find the means to free a servant, then he fasts two consecutive months. And of course, these are lunar consecutive months. However, it could be the case that a few days 
come in the middle to interrupt the consecutiveness of your fasting. For example, Ramadan comes in the middle. Now you'd have to fast Ramadan, of course, that is wajib. But then after Ramadan, you can continue on with the expiation and you don't need to begin anew. Because this break which you had in your expiation was due to a valid reason. Or for example, you might have Eid al-Adha coming in the way. So does this mean that you have to begin all over again? The answer is no, you just simply continue on. Perhaps you may have the Ayyam al-Tashriq coming in the way. Now you're not allowed to fast Ayyam al-Tashriq and we took the narration of that as evidence, which was the statement of Aisha, that people were forbidden from passing the Ayyam al-Tashriq except the one who did not find the Hadi or the sacrificial animal from the ones who were performing the Tamattu'ah. So the point is that the Ayyam al-Tashriq are not to be fasted, they are an Eid. So if this comes in the way and breaks up your consecutiveness, then this does not harm, you simply carry on from where you left off. Or what about a woman entering into the menstruation period, and this would happen every month for most women. The answer is this is a valid reason to stop fasting of course, and you simply continue from where you left off. Or for example, somebody turns mad. Now, the fasting is not accepted from a mad person, but then when he regains his intellect, he does not have to begin anew, he simply carries on from where he left off. However, somebody might try to get a little clever, and he might say, okay, I have two months of fasting as an expiation. So what about if I start this expiation of fasting at, let's say, the beginning of the Hijjah, so in that case, we can be sure that the Eid al-Adha will come and then the Ayyam al-Tashriq. So this would definitely give this person some respite. So it will not actually be two consecutive months, literally speaking, because he would have a valid excuse to break the fasting. So what about this now? He's trying to play a little game or a trickery. He thinks he's clever. Well, the point is this. Your deeds are by your intention. And when Allah Jalla wa ala says that it has to be two consecutive months and then with your intention, you try to rig it up so that it is not two consecutive months, then you will be judged by your intention. So we say that if this is the intention of a person, then he has to begin anew after the Eid al-Adha and the Ayyam al-Tashriq, because now he's trying to play a little trickery or a game with Allah Jalla wa ala. And this is from the habits of the Yahud, as is well known. And then likewise, we can say the same thing with the illness. If you are ill, such that it prevents you from passing, then again, you don't have to begin anew. Rather, you just carry on from where you left off. What about this situation, though? A person is, let's say, drowning, and he needs your help, otherwise he's going to die, and you are fasting because of the kafara of the dhuhar. And in order for you to help him, you have to drink water and energize yourself by eating something or perhaps drinking something. And this is what you have to do in order to save him. Now, if you do this, so you break your fast in order to save him, then what about this? Do you have to begin anew? The answer here is no, because you broke your fast for a valid shara'i reason. So the answer is you just continue from where you left off. And the reason is because you broke your fast due to a valid shara'i reason. What about if somebody is forced to break the fast? So your life is at threat, if you don't break the fast, somebody is going to harm you or kill you, and you break the fast? The answer is yes, you can break the fast, and you don't have to begin anew. What about if you broke the fast out of forgetfulness? You forgot you were fasting and you ate or drank something? The answer is your fast is not broken in the very first place. So we don't have to talk about the consecutiveness being interrupted, because it's not interrupted, your fast is not broken, you just simply continue on the fasting for that day and it will be counted as a valid fast. What about if you have to travel and you have to break your fast because you're not obliged to fast during a travel? The answer is yes, you can break your fast and you don't have to begin anew afterwards. But take note that if somebody travels in order to break the fast, so as to give himself an excuse to break the fast, then in this case he's not allowed to break the fast because this is a hila or a little trickery which he's playing and so a hila does not make the haram into halal and so this is not a valid shara'i reason for you to break the fast because of course your deeds are judged by your intention now let us talk about the third option which is to fast 60 poor people we say 60 poor people and we do not say 
to feed 60 times because you could feed one person 60 times and this would not suffice rather it needs to be 60 different poor people because Allah Jalla wa ala says Sittina miskina, 60 poor people the question now is what do you feed them well if we look at the ayah Allah Jalla wa ala simply says فَإِطْعَامُ سِتِّينَ miskina, so feeding 60 poor people so whatever the people consider to be a valid feeding then this is what needs to be done because we have to let the customs of the people decide what feeding means. So if you just give him, let's say, a penny sweet, then the people would not consider this as feeding somebody, meaning to say it is not considered as proper food which you are feeding them. Some scholars of the Hanbali Madhab, they say that the minimum needs to be one mud of wheat. One mud is how much you can hold in two cupful of hands. And they say, that if there is anything other than wheat from the staple food of the land then it needs to be two mud and that this is the minimum which needs to be given so they have given this limit to guide the people thereby so in other words they say when it comes to wheat it needs to be one mud but when it comes to other foodstuffs measured using the gale like dried dates, barley, raisins and dried cheese then the minimum here needs to be two Mud. The evidence for this particular number which they give is taken from the hadith in the Sahihain where Ka'ab ibn Ujra had some lice falling from his head and he had to shave his head and of course this would incur a fidya to be paid which is a ransom and so the Prophet ﷺ told him to sacrifice a sheep if he cannot find this then he has to fast three days or feed six poor people half a sa' each. Now half a sa' is two mud. That's fair enough. But then the question is, why do they say that when it comes to wheat, it just needs to be one mud? Why is wheat also not two mud, which is half a sa'? The answer they give is because during the Khilafah of Muawiyah, he made one mud of wheat to be equal to two mud of other items like dried dates and barley. But the point is that this idea of one mud of wheat being equal to two mud of other food items has no evidence during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, we will not go with this decision of Muawiyah because it opposes the decision of the Prophet. So this leaves us with two choices then. If you're going to feed these 60 poor people, then you feed them half a sa of barley, wheat, dried dates or dried cheese basically any food which can be measured using the gale so you would feed them half a sa' and so this would agree with what the Prophet ﷺ ordered Ka'ab ibn Ujra to do in his expiation for shaving the head during the ihram or you simply feed them that which will suffice them as one meal so basically if you were to pay for their meal let's say an evening meal or an afternoon meal then this would suffice as you feeding the poor so we say it is perfectly fine for you to just simply purchase a restaurant meal for them it's just that some scholars say no you have to actually give the food to them so there must be a transferal of ownership but there is no evidence for that and we need to know that when it comes to those expiations in which you have to feed the poor people then this type of expiation can be divided up into three categories. So here they are, number one, where the Sharia specifies what you have to feed and the people you have to feed. And an example of this would be if you were to shave your head during the ihram because of a valid reason, then you would have to give six poor people half a sa'a each. So the amount you have to give is specified and whom you give it to is also specified. So here the number of people is specified. Number two, that in which only what you have to feed is specified but not the number of people. And the example here would be the Zakatul Fitr. We know you have to give one sa of dried dates, raisins, dried cheese or barley. But what is not specified is how many people you need to give this to. So with your one sa of dried dates, let's say you want to give this as Zakatul Fitr, how many people do you give this to? Is it one poor person? Two, three, four, hundred? How many? It's not specified. The point is you just need to give this amount of food away. And the scholars of the Hanabila said 
that each poor person must not receive less than a mud of this food. This is the guideline which they have given, but the point is ultimately, what is specified is the amount you give, not how many people you give. Then the third category is, when the number of people is specified, but not how much you give is specified. And the example here would be the kafara of the dhihar. It would also be the kafara of breaking the oath, because it says that you have to feed 10 poor people with the average of what you feed your families with. So it's not specified what this is, but the 10 poor people is specified. And the same thing with the kafara of having intercourse with the wife during the daytime of Ramadan, you have to feed 60 poor people. But what is not specified is how much you feed them. So when it comes to this last category, because it's an open-ended matter, even if you were to just pay for them for a meal, then this would in fact suffice. Notice if somebody has two kafarat on him, let's say one for the har and the other one for having intercourse during the daytime of Ramadan, both of these kafara are exactly the same. So now if he was to let's say free a servant, then in a case like this, because he has two kafarat on him, he needs to make the intention as to which kafara he is performing. If he only has one kafara upon him, then he does not need to make this intention because his intention is automatically made. Because he only has one kafara, he could only ever have one particular intention. If he is fasting two consecutive months, then is it obligatory upon him before fasting every day to have this intention of fasting? The answer is the same as with the Ramadan. The answer is no. It is simply enough for you to intend that you're going to fast two consecutive months. If your fasting is broken in the middle, let's say because of an illness or perhaps the woman is menstruating, then she simply renews her intention that she's going to carry on fasting these consecutive days. It's basically the same as Ramadan. What about this issue? The man who is the Muzahir, the one who made the Dhihar on his wife, he's fasting the two consecutive months. And let's say after only about 10 days, he has intercourse with the wife. Now we know you have to perform the kafara before you have intercourse with the wife. But let's say before he completes it, he has intercourse with the wife. Let's say 10 days into the fasting. The question is, does he now have to begin anew? Some scholars say yes, he has to begin anew. Allah Jalla wa ala says, فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَّ Then fasting two consecutive months before they touch each other. Now the point is, if he has intercourse with the wife during the daytime, then of course that breaks the fast and he would have to begin anew. That's fair enough. But what about if he does it during the night time when he's not fasting? Does he now begin anew? Some scholars say yes, and they quote the evidence, which we have just quoted from the Qur'an. But the better opinion is that even though he's sinful for doing this, but it does not break the consecutiveness. So he can still continue on the fasting of the two consecutive months, but he made a mistake in having intercourse with the wife during the night time. And this is the madhab of al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and it is the better opinion than the Hanbali madhab on this issue. Or what about if the Eid comes in between his consecutive fasting? So obviously he's not fasting then, but if he has intercourse with the wife during this day, then does he have to begin anew? The answer is the same, he does not have to begin anew, but he is sinful for having intercourse with the wife before fulfilling the kafara because he has not obeyed Allah Jalla wa'ala when Allah tells him to offer the kafara before they touch each other. And the same ruling applies with feeding the poor people. So if he has fed, let's say, 30 poor people, so 30 to go, and then he has intercourse with the wife, then does he have to begin anew? So he has to newly feed 60 poor people? Or can he just continue on with the rest of the 30? The answer is, even though he is sinful, he can continue on with the rest of the 30. And we spoke about the difference of opinion. Some scholars say that when it comes to feeding the poor people, then Allah Jalla wa ala does not mention that it needs to be done before you touch each other. But in any case, we simply say that even if we go by the opinion that it must be done before you touch each other, meaning feeding the 60 poor people, still it does not break the consecutiveness. Rather, you continue on from where you left off, even though at best it can be said that you are sinful. So it's just like the situation with the fasting. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. What is the evidence that the expiation must be before having intercourse? We have an evidence from the Qur'an. 
and in evidence from the hadith which we took. Recall them. Question number two. The first port of call in the expiation is to free a servant. Now we mentioned three conditions for this servant. Recall them. Question number three. What if a person wants to commit a hila? He says that the two consecutive months of fasting, he's going to deliberately start it on the first of the hijjah because for sure he's going to have the four days of Eid in which you do not fast. That's the 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th. What do we say about such a matter? Question number four. If he is fasting two consecutive months and he has intercourse with his wife during the night time before the fasting period finishes, does he have to start the two months anew? Justify your answer and state whether he is sinful or not.